Okay. Yeah. Blooper was April. <sighs> oh my God. Was it? I mean, honestly, the last three months, I'm, I'm just, I'm so glad it's where we're, where, where we're at, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mandy Ray. My practice is called Ecstatic Astrology, and I am with Practical Astros or Krista. Hi, yep. I'm Krista and many people know me as Practical Astros. So thanks for thanks for uh, joining again for uh, another forecast. These are always so much fun. It's always a fun text like, do you want to do it again? <laughs> and I'm always thinking about it. And I'm like, I've got to text her. And yeah. I'm so glad that we are doing this. It's, it is so much fun. Um, and we're doing May because Yay. we've been not three. This is our third time. Yeah, I think so. Yay. And we were uh, just before we hopped on discussing the fact that Pluto is stationing retrograde right now, right as we speak in Aquarius. And we were discussing whether or not we work with it. Uh, And I think we both agreed similarly that we're not exactly experts, but we do um, pay attention, Mm -hmm. you know, I called Pluto an acquaintance, Um, but I really loved what you were saying uh, about Pluto and stationing retrograde in Aquarius and it being a mirror, Mm -hmm. um, continuing on from the Capricorn story because they're both ruled by Saturn. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know that there's a whole lot to say about Pluto stationing retrograde, um, but it is happening right now. So I felt like we needed to acknowledge it. Like you Mm -hmm. said, Uh, we need to go and tip our hat to Pluto and the empowerment that we're all going to experience. (laughs) Actually, the retrograde being, you know, a lot of people say retrograde is inside introspective. And I think Pluto already is an introspective Hmm. um, archetype, I guess, if you will. So I think that it kind of makes sense to just continue. Yes, I think introspective in how we fit into the global dynamic or even society or even our friend groups and how we work with that social media probably coming up a lot, which Mm. I think looking at May overall, it's going to be really wonderful, but we're about to make a big shift into from Taurus stuff into Gemini stuff and to have all of that happening, Pluto stationing retrograde in Aquarius. I think that social media may become more of a theme um, and not just social media communication in general, but I mean, we've got AI um, happening. (laughs) It's happening, I guess. Like, (laughs) is it really me doing this? I mean, that joke is kind of cheesy, but it's worth saying. Um, because that, that all is, um, an association with Aquarius, Gemini, the air signs, communication, the internet. Um, so Pluto stationing retrograde, I think is just a, a starting point for something that I think is really going to become a theme, Mm. but we don't have to worry about it at least until closer to the end (laughs) of the month. Uh, because we have the beautiful astrology of May. Yay. 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 I will say one thing about the Pluto and Aquarius is, uh, you know, going retrograde, you know, this is the last time it's going retrograde and to Capricorn, right? It hits in September. Is that right? Because it goes very slowly Mm -hmm. and then it goes out in December or November. I think it's after the elections, it kind of goes back forward. So it's like this third round, this final round as it, goes retrograde reminds me of Cinderella going back to get her slipper before her carriage transforms into a pumpkin. It's like this whole, you know, death and rebirth, like transformation that is Pluto, but it's like, there's one last thing that Pluto forgot. And it's that sloth pace of going back to change it. But like, this is kind of like the last gasp of it going back into Capricorn. And we'll, when we go into September's month, you know, Mm -hmm. if we do a forecast for them, we'll talk about it more, but it's like, this is the, this is the moment where Cinderella realizes that she left her slipper on the staircase and has to turn around to go get it. Um, I don't know. It's just like this. What does it mean? What does it mean? Like the, the insights that are coming in today, I feel like glean a little bit, um, of insight into that story. So yeah, especially in whichever house it happens in, in yeah. your own personal chart, because I think I, I've seen it. I, it's in my eighth house and it's already, th- those themes have kind of come up. Eighth th- housing. 
<laughs> the eighth housing, uh, you know, which it it is a that's a deep place, but Pluto in itself kind of brings that eighth house energy to everywhere mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, yeah. And the modern association with Scorpio, I do like that. If I were going to associate it with a sign, probably Scorpio would be the one. Yeah. Um. So I know traditionally. Pluto isn't even a thing, but it's definitely making himself known, right? Yeah. So he was out there in the sky, you know, mm -hmm. way back when too. So I mean, like that the the myths around, you know, Hades have always existed. It's just that we've been able to kind of witness it with with um, you know telescopes. So, uh, but I also think it's funny because I think astrology winks and tells us lots of jokes if we can catch it. If, if Pluto is slowing down so they can get all those awesome trines from all the Gemini later in the month, it's like, instead of all the squares, like the Taurus hits her head into the corner all the time anyway. And so it's like all those squares, you know, from Pluto and Aquarius, as soon as something goes into Taurus, it just like headbutts, you know, the, the Pluto and Aquarius. But when it gets into Gemini, the fact that it's kind of going backwards, it's, it's like a, a little wind chime to all the Gemini placements, which is a much different vibe than that you know the the square from um the, the square to all the Taurus stuff so absolutely realizations Thanks, rather than you know things, things. to overcome <laughs> right exactly <laughs> or oh this is surfacing I didn't even know it was there okay yeah. hey I mean yeah that's absolutely totally agree with that and yeah. The twinkliness of the air signs I do like because we've had so much um heavy earth I mean especially since 2020 it's like all of the Capricorn stuff and now we've had Uranus and um, Taurus and mm -hmm. Jupiter and everything and even though Taurus is I would say much less heavy it just it feels nice to have some air some change some yeah. um, different even ideas you know so and yeah. yes it's scary the new world the brave new world scares me <laughs> it's very Plutonian that uh, Pluto and Aquarius really shows that part to me about myself, like, oh, mm -hmm. wow, I don't know what I'm going to do closer to the election with social media. I don't necessarily oh, right, yeah. want to be on it. It scares me. AI scares me. Do I believe it? Do I believe this article? You know, you just read a headline. And so there, and, and even, you know, <laughs> robots, I hate to say it, please, <laughs> overlords, do not hate me for this. But I mean, oh my goodness, you know, I don't know how you can't look at that and and especially um, movies that depict robots that do mm -hmm. things and just kind of look at Pluto and Aquarius and go, okay, whoa, it's coming really fast. And I don't yeah. know how to handle it. So, I mean, I, absolutely with the trines to Gemini, maybe that can be on our minds a little bit. Like mm. we have to think in, um, in terms that I don't think we've ever thought in before. Yeah. So, huh, all right. <laughs> Pluto. Okay. So do you not like those like weird robot dogs that like crouch? Oh my like, crawl. <laughs> no, and I saw a video of one uh recently and it was a robot and a robot dog fighting. And I was like, is this even real or is it AI? <laughs> I don't know. You know, and I just get really um a squirmy, you know, whenever yeah. I start to think about it. I'm squirming in my chair right now thinking about it. I, I had a dream one time of a drone chasing me. Wow. And I, I know, I know. So I think my dream world also um, serves to terrify me sometimes because I woke up from that and I don't look at drones the same way at all. Yeah. One came at me at the beach and it was probably just filming the beach, you know, some dude flying mm -hmm. his drone. And I, I immediately started looking around. And my partner was like, what is wrong with you? I was like a drone. He was like, it's a drone. What is wrong with you? <laughs> okay it's just me all right drones <laughs> yeah I live uh, out in the sticks and um, when drones come around here there have been many a neighbor that have just shot them down <laughs> because usually it's a real estate agent getting like aerial footage of some sort of property or farm that they're gonna you know put a bunch of houses on and so the the hillbillies that literally you know demand that you take their gun out of their cold dead hands they're gonna like oh i'll just shoot your your air robot down <laughs> it's funny i um i am i mean maybe i should be more scared of um the pluto and aquarius like robot overlords but i'm kind of like 
by the time I get scared of it, it's just going to be too late. So I just, I, I, you know, I mean, my son's Furby disturbs me, <laughs> but uh, like the, I don't know, like all the, the robot, the, the, all the electronic kind of advances that have happened. I'm like, yeah, that's probably not real, but it doesn't um, affect me in the same way. Maybe I should just be worried about other things. And then you can take the worry basket of, of artificial intelligence for sure. perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, it's there anyway. So it's yeah. my burden to bear. I do have Chiron and Gemini. And oh, North there you go. Node and Gemini. There's a lot of a lot of uh, stuff there. So. I'll just check in with you. Like, should I be worried about this? Yeah. Like, if you've already worried about all these things, have you probably put them in an order of like, what's the most appropriate thing to be concerned about? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I have Mars and Virgo. So it's yeah. hard for me not to I actually talk about worry a lot. Um with regards to Virgo, because I mm -hmm. think, you know, you want to do it right. And, it, and it, I'm a little like Chucky from the Rugrats. I don't know if you've ever seen yeah. the Rugrats, but he's always, he's always like, guys, I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel about AI. Yeah. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm a, I feel like that it's maybe good because I'm Mars and Virgo too. I think that a constructive way is to be really selective with how much data you give to people for free. Like your, mm -hmm. your intellectual property is your self and your opinions and your web patterning and your social media engagement. So I encourage you to lie about this to algorithms because that in itself, if, if, if you don't want to give your information to people, but they're going to take it anyway, just lie about it yes. because that, that just poisons the algorithm. And mm. then it, it's a, it's a way of protecting. So you can disengage and not, you know, make sure that all your privacy blockers are on. Don't ever allow people to sell your information. You can unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. That's what I've been doing is just unsubscribing from everything. All the political text I'm getting, all the emails I'm getting, I'm just really reeling it, reeling it in. And, you know, Mars and Aries, I was just like unsub, 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 a pole all over the place. But I also think to be on the offensive is just to lie about your own personal data and put it out there to kind of poison the well of the algorithm so that the AI overlords will have misinformation that maybe will cause them to malfunction and then we'll have to just start over in some sort of like agrarian little house on the prairie existence when we like screw our ro robot overlords. But I feel like there's ways to kind of play with it. Um, yeah, that's that's, that's a wonderful <laughs> Pluto and Aquarius Pluto retrograde yeah. message and pay attention everyone, because that was a great piece of advice. I'm going to do that immediately. Uh <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gem Gemini placements tell you to lie. That's right. <laughs> lie, that's lie, exactly right. Lie for the good of humanity. <laughs> I need to hear it. I, you, I can't lie. <laughs> Just really bad. I Maybe can't not. lie online though. Yeah, online, with, with your can. fingers, you can lie like, oh, yeah, I, I read that magazine. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> oh, man. So we don't really have to rush. You know why? Because <laughs> there's not as much this yeah. month. I was looking at the calendar. I was like, hey, where do we need to go next? I'm like, oh, we don't really have anything huge happening until like Monday and it's Thursday. So yeah. Um, and that is, do you want me to share my calendar? Yeah, I don't have mine pulled up. Got you. So sun sextile Saturn. Um, and that may be a good time for us to go unsubscribe <laughs> <laughs> as well. I mean, Saturn and Pisces, you know, Pisces, I feel like is really good with delusion and hiding things mm -hmm. and maybe using Saturn there in that way can help a little bit. Um, I know that may be a little bit of a perverse way to look at Saturn and Pisces, but um, if you were trying to build something in um, the background, this is a good mm. sort of, I guess, aspect to use. Sextiles are opportunity. I really like that. I think I saw um, heart astrologers say sextiles were like the good shadow. Uh, yeah. I love that. Well, and um, the sextile is nature is an, of the nature of Venus. And so we have the sun and Venus is sign and Saturn and Venus is exaltation sign. So, and, and right before that new moon, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the balsamic moon for like the real secret, deep, deep intention. Um, because you're letting, as you're letting things go, you're saying, I let this go to let these things in. It's like, mm. it's the doorway before the, the, the 
um, intentional new moon. So that's, that's a really sweet moon day. It is. And, uh, especially with, I think having, I like the sex doll between Taurus and Pisces, it feels mm-hmm. very fertile and imaginative and, yeah. um, being able to bring imagination into reality. Uh, so I really like that, that, and I have the tilling because I mean, Taurus being, uh, planting maybe mm-hmm. fertile ground. Uh, so Saturn seems like it would be the tiller in this situation, you know, yeah. tilling up the dirt and made of iron, you know, like the, that Saturnine nature. And I think that it might be the third decan of Taurus that's called the plow. I think that's what Austin Coppock talks it is like the plow, um, of just, you know, have it cause Saturn rules it. So it's like, plowing the ground and we're not quite there. I think it's on the 10th, maybe that it goes into the third decan, but yeah, that um, sounds right. But just having that so that you're able to plant things, you have to break the ground first. Mm, Absolutely. And especially like you said, right before new moon, which is just ripe for beginnings, especially this new moon. Maybe we should take a look at it. Uh, Okay. I'm going to share my chart here. May 7th. I have central time here. Uh, so if you are in another time zone, please adjust for your time. Uh, so we have a new moon at 18 degrees of Taurus. And so, yeah, just a couple of days after that, the sun yeah. moves into the plow decan, the third decan <laughs> of Taurus. Um, I love that you have this wonderful memory because I would have to have like a sheet to, <laughs> to remember. It's, it's selective stuff. for sure. <laughs> I think it's wonderful because mine is just not as good, but I, I love the plow reference, especially knowing that the sextile is still there. I mean, yeah. Saturn is at 17, 13, the new moon's at 18, two, it's mm-hmm. less than a degree away um, from the opportunity from the, I love the fact that especially with Uranus and Taurus opportunity really presents itself. Mm. Uranus to me almost as a planet of opportunity because it is so unbound because it is so um, I don't know. It's just like a a lightning strike, right. Of ideas of maybe someone offering you. And I think with Uranus in the mix, if you just pay attention during this new moon to opportunities that present themselves, uh, I just feel like that's a really wonderful way to point or direct your energy during this new moon. Yeah. And I think Patrick Watson called like Uranus might feel malefic in the moment, like a Uranus, you know, aspect to your chart might hurt, but can be benefic in the long run. So even like if you uh, don't intend to have something horrible happen, something horrible happening or something inconvenient or just out of the blue, um, can also be an opportunity. So it's like, if something crappy happens to you on Tuesday, May 7th, it could be kind of like a blessing in disguise, like malefic in the moment, but benefic in the long run. And, um, you know, having that sextile to, to, to Saturn, Saturn likes long run things. So maybe it is kind of that, that just give it some time, you know, it, over to, over time, maybe this unfortunate or inconvenient or just shocking thing, um, that might feel kind of crappy that day might, might turn out to be like a really beneficial thing because it's still within three degrees of Jupiter. So that conjunction is still there. Yeah. And Venus is on the other side in uh, her own home sign. So when you have both benefics and the new moon in between them, plus Uranus and Uranus answering to Venus there Mm -hmm. and Saturn answering to Jupiter, which is answering to Venus, it all kind of points to it definitely it feels benefic, whether it be in the long run or in the moment. And I like the, um, I love that the, the malefic, but it just feels like that in the moment because change generally does. I mean, Mm -hmm. especially if it's unexpected change, which is Uranus has that nature unexpected out of the blue Mm -hmm. change, um, or just something that happens that, you know, makes you think about switching directions, but, um, I like the idea of if you see a wave coming, 
rather than plant your feet in the sand and get knocked over by the wave, grab your surfboard kind of a (laughs) thing, like be prepared for that, you know, instead of, or, you know, if someone's going to yank the tablecloth out from under you or the rug, I guess is the saying, whatever, um, yank the rug out from under you. (laughs) If you were a dish, it would be the tablecloth. (laughs) Uh, But if you're a person, probably a rug and that's a Uranian thing, Mm -hmm. you know, but maybe, um, it's because there's a snake under there and you're being shown the snake. You know? Yeah. Or you're Alice in Wonderland at the Mad Tea Parties. Part, the Mad. I can't speak. Tea party. I know. The Mad Tea Party party. And you are in a teacup on the table and someone pulls the tablecloth off. You know, I mean, like that to me, like that whole scene feels like a Uranian thing. <sighs> And also with, you know, Uranus is in Taurus. There haven't been that many things that have gone through Taurus, except Jupiter that's been like steadily going through and then the moon every month. So like all month when things go through Taurus, so the sun, we'll talk about it later, you know, Venus and then Mercury, all of, all three of those are going to go pass through Uranus. So it's going to be this, those, those moments of like lots of flashes, you know, Mm -hmm. and, but being that Venus is home kind of overseeing all of that i just feel like um the the likelihood of it being uh more positive even on, in the moment is probably there as opposed to if it you know when it was in aries might mm. might have been a little harder <laughs> absolutely yeah the jupiter uranus conjunction of venus was in aries during that i'm pretty yeah. sure and that you know while it answered to venus it it was still a little sharp, you know, a little like, ah, okay. And I I was looking forward and that's, I guess the beauty of of following astrology or even just being an enthusiast is just like to know it's going to change and Mm -hmm. it's going to change for the better in this situation, you know? Um, and then Gemini is going to screw it all up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I should have said shake. Um, but yeah, so that's the new moon and that you can see the the kind of empty nature. I mean, there are things, I think I have some things written down, like for instance, some asteroids, um, I want to say Ceres goes retrograde. Um, oh, but that's even after. So Mars and Aries sextiles Pluto, May 3rd. Okay, so that's something that I didn't put on the calendar, but Mars does mm-hmm. sextile Pluto Friday. Then we have the new moon on the seventh. Uh, and then, yeah, it's not till really the 13th that anything I would say significant, the moon keeps moving. I mean, obviously, but the sun conjuncts Uranus, like you were saying in Taurus on, uh, the 13th and then Venus, uh, sextile Saturn, and then Mercury moves into Taurus. And so we're heading towards those pings with even Mercury and Uranus. And I think I don't know, just this moment of the 13th kind of sets the, the tone for that. So I have a rainbow, Mm -hmm. Venus sextile Saturn, sun conjunct Uranus. It's like, okay, here's the thing. Yeah. Especially with Venus and it's similar to the Monday, the sixth was sun sextile Saturn. Now we have Venus doing it on the 13th. So it's like, oh, these two pings are not just something conjoining Uranus. It's also things sextiling Saturn on the way up to it, which I find really cool. You know, it's like this, um, you can do it. Here's the path here. And that's why it looks like a rainbow path. Cause I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah, here's the path. And maybe also something changes. You decide this is the way I want to go. It's showing itself to me, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, um, Mercury is like out of the shadow. It's like definitely picking up speed. It, it's funny that it's like picking up speed and then it like immediately is like emergency break when it goes into Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very Maybe true. not emergency break, but just like it lands in like a, a big mess of like soft pillows and it really can't move that much. Um, yeah. But yeah, I like, I like that flow. Um, just, just, just going into that on, on the 15th, but then on the 17th, it, immediately engages with Pluto. (laughs) It does. It does. And I I think um, maybe a way of harnessing, you know, even the week of the seventh, that's pretty, or the sixth is pretty empty. Um, Harnessing that 
value, what you value, I think looking deeply into what you value, what you want to cultivate as you move into Mercury square Pluto, Mm. because that's going to show you where the struggle is. If there is a struggle there, it, it, you know, it may not be a very long transit. It's a transit that lasts like a day and Mercury moves on. Um, but it's, it's going to show you where maybe you might come up against some things, you Mm. know what I mean? So if you really, pay attention to the things that are working, the things that you're planting, the things that you're growing and Mm -hmm. building when Mercury squares Pluto, I think what it might show is just uh, maybe a goal that you need to tweak in order to get there, Mm -hmm. or um, perhaps maybe some pushback you would get from the outside world with it being Aquarius, Pluto and Aquarius. Um, And Pluto of course is retrograde. So, you know, it may just be an internal a uh, realization of a place that you've been disempowered as well. Yeah. So it, it is a little bit of a struggle, but I think paying attention to the really good things on the way up to that, then you can look at that day and go, okay, this is the place that I need to just maybe pay attention to that needs a little tweaking. Um, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. I like that. Hopefully I like, I like how there was a, a little icon that had two people fighting over an Island and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Well, I, I was just looking. So Mercury goes into Gemini in June and he's only there for like a few weeks. Mm. Um, and so I was just seeing if, if Mercury engages with, um, with any, anything else major, it looks like it's going to just kind of plot along through, through Taurus. But then once it gets into Gemini, it's only in in there for, I think 14 days. Um, but I wonder if that 17th story when Pluto and Mercury are squared, when Mercury meets up with Uranus later on, like first week of first week of June, I think is when it happens. Mm -hmm. If that's kind of a a little bit a continuation of the story, like what do you have to go back and tweak? And then when it meets up with Uranus, it's like, here's how to do it, you know? Mm. Cause like, I feel like Mercury and Uranus really are compadres as far as like problem solving, you know, and in Taurus, it's like, okay, what's the tangible way that we can kind of really make this work. I need, I need Uranus's help to kind of get that clarity again. Cause I've spent the last two weeks in the slow sign of Taurus. I need something to kind of like jolt me before it goes into Gemini. Um, yeah. and then it's just going to race through Gemini, which just cracks me up. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's really that um, wing footed, <laughs> <Gemini-coded. laughs> mess, very Gemini coded. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I didn't even think about that. That's a really great point. The the meetup with Mercury and Uranus before and anything, honestly, because I think being prepared for change and on the 18th, I have Venus conjoining Uranus chance or change. Mm-hmm. Um being prepared for that before everything moves into Gemini is a very good thing because Gemini is so um, (laughs) double-minded. It's just, there's so many things to choose from so many different ways of saying something, so many um, ideas, information flying around busyness um, and a lot, and sometimes maybe too much with, with people's mouths, especially going into an election season. I look at the astrology going into election season and, you know, whether it's going to be one of those that really sucks or one that's like, just, you know, is it smooth? Is it, and having everything in Gemini is not totally great to me. Um, when information is a big part of how we know who to vote for, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, and there's so much of it and the squares to Saturn and Pisces. So, being prepared for that and also being prepared to, um, I, especially with Uranus being in such a fixed earth sign that's, you know, about values. That's about my comfort. That's about mm-hmm. what I love, what I want to spend my money on. Mm-hmm. And then realizations and, and knowing that that might change going into a season of unsure um, economy or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, really being clear on that. And I think you're honest might serve that purpose, you know, whether it takes something out of your life that you don't need value wise, or you change your mind on something, or you decide to only buy 100% cotton underwear like me. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, things that's like thing. that. Yeah. Like in a real, <laughs> like tangible, realistic way. And, you know, we talk about, you know, in, in modern astrology, Uranus kind of ruling Aquarius. And then 
and, you know, I don't use the modern roller ships, but I consider them because it's like, that's just more, it's a different way to look at the jewel that is astrology. Mm -hmm. Right. But the, the idea of Aquarius as being like the revolutionary sign, um, you know, I have argued and other people have argued, this is not my idea that Taurus is the most revolutionary sign because when it makes a change, it makes the change. It makes it for a value reason. It makes it for reasons that it has something to stand behind and stand on. And the, you know, revolution doesn't just mean going away from whatever the power dynamic is. A lot of it is returning to. So a revolution of a cycle means like, like I think of like the back to the earth hippies in the seventies, they were going back to, to like, to have control of their food and to have control of their medicine and like women giving birth at home, as opposed to the hospital, that was revolutionary mm -hmm. in the sense of it was a change from the status quo, but it was also a return to things. So using that, that the idea of a return as, as a revolution and Uranus and Taurus offers us that way to, to participate in revolution in a way that is a permanent thing that is bound with our own value in a real tangible, tangible way, like buying only cotton underwear. It's like, I hate the bra that I'm wearing. And I, today I was like, I am never going to put this bra on again. I'm just going to go buy myself a new bra. It's like so simple, but it's like, it, it it's like a, I'm never going to suffer through wearing a poorly fit bra again in my life yeah. forever. Like I have decided that it's funny that you mentioned the underwear. Cause I was like, <laughs> I'm right there with you. And, and yeah. making that it's like revolutionary. Cause you're, you, then it becomes part of just who you are. And that stability of Taurus can give us that confidence of when we get into Gemini season, we're going to play around, you know, cause Gemini is playful. It, it, it's not bound by these permanent um, decisions, but if we have the foundation of like what we value and the revolution that we're choosing to participate in personally, then we're, we're steady and grounded in that value sense. And then we get to just play with the Gemini mm. and play around and go back and forth and try things on to see what the new version of our, of our revolution is going to be, you know, what the new versions of our values, but it's on the foundation of that Uranus and Taurus. I feel like Uranus and Taurus is going to be, it's not very sexy, but it's going to be a long lasting revolution that we can look back maybe better in a mirror or reflecting back on it. Um, you know, after we, after we get out of it, it's like, you know, the things that were happening there, they, they, they definitely plowed the field for this, um, for this garden to grow. Cause when Uranus mm -hmm. goes into Gemini, all bets are off. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that it, exactly. And I'm so glad again, that Jupiter will be going through Gemini too. First, mm -hmm. it's like to, to kind of lead the way. Yeah. And speaking of Jupiter, I didn't realize, um, something I missed on my notes was that it's also a Kazemi on the Oh YouTube, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, with Jupiter. So gosh, look at all That's of that, gorgeous. you know, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, and Jupiter being a benefic, um, being something that enlarges or expands, or I just love the idea of Jupiter being a breath in, you know, where you're just filling your lungs. And when I see this Kazemi plus the Venus Uranus conjunction, plus the fact Mercury's in Taurus, um, it just points to, again, that value coming up and not being able to wear that bra again, you know, like I can't do it. I'm going to throw it out today. Yeah. And maybe and this is the day that people go, you know, get new wardrobes. I could totally see that happening yeah. around the 18. People are shopping. People are looking at, you know, at what they can do to their homes, um, just very tangible gardens, whatever it can be your finances, you know, can you back this chart up a little mm -hmm. bit? That sounds very sexy. Can you back that up a little bit? So mm -hmm. just where, um, just to see when the moon is at that 28 degrees. So the moon will try in that because oh, right here, mm. just before, yep. um, the, the exact Venus Uranus. So that's really sweet. That happened at the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. Remember it was like, it happened and the moon was at 29 degrees Virgo right before it moved into, <laughs> into Libra. Like it wanted to see the conjunction yeah. before it left. Um, there and the same it thing, yeah, it's just checking it out, out right before. That's um, so perfect. Yeah. So it'll try and everything. I mean, this, 
that's why I keep saying, and I'm going to, I guess, just go out on the a limb and say, I think May is the luckiest month of mm. this year. I mean, mm -hmm. and that we have some of the luckiest astrology, if you will. Yeah. And the, the this day, for instance, is one of them, I think with the moon and Virgo trying, uh, it will try and its ruler first in Taurus co-present with the ruler of Taurus. So mm -hmm. it's just got so much working together. Um, in fact, the only thing that's really not is uh, Mercury maybe squaring Pluto still just a tad, but, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think you can work it out. In fact, it's almost as if Mercury receives that square and then the moon's like, well, here, here's how we fix it in Virgo mm -hmm. because yeah. Virgo does get those details so correct, you know, so, mm -hmm. or it parses things out. So wipes the dust off all of those things. Um, but then it'll go right into Libra. So mm -hmm. it'll, it'll then kind of like whisper back to Pluto, like, this is how it's going to happen. <laughs> that is so perfect. It'll be like the mediary between, you know? Yes, absolutely. And then the next day, I'll just go ahead and keep this up because Mars does hit the North node on the 19th, I believe. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. With the moon opposing it at the South node. So that is, um, and I have a, I think on my calendar, when I share it again, you'll see a little uh, target and mm -hmm. it's because it does very much pinpoint the eclipse story, I think on this day. Yeah. Um, and it's possibly of all of the days, maybe this month, this does seem like it could be one of the more stressful or frustrating. Um, and I don't mean that to sow that into people's minds, but Mars hitting the North node is like, I'm going to do this. And the mm -hmm. moon at the South node is like, okay, are you sure? Have you checked with everyone first? Is anyone yeah. okay with this? And um, there's a little bit of a tug of war there, you know, especially with Mars being domicile and just strong and the North node being such a, has a voracious appetite, you know, mm -hmm. so it's going to do something. And so, you know, tempering yourself on this day might be good. I'm glad that the, the moon answers to Venus, um, because I, I do feel like that slowness of Venus and Taurus is going to help maybe temper mm -hmm. the Mars energy a little bit, but what do you, do you think anything about? Yeah, I, I agree. This might be like the, the, um, the first day where it feels, it reminds us of April, mm. like the kind of the energy of it. So, I mean, just, you know, with, uh, the North node with a malefic, it can just make the malefics malefic more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mars is at home. There's not a lot of other things in Aries. Like as soon as Mercury leaves, he's going to have that whole house to himself just to play around in. <laughs> and so when he meet, meets the North node, it'll be like, <laughs> like feral child that has been in his house all alone. And it's like peak moment for that, for whatever shenanigans he's gotten into but I wonder like, so with the moon, like it, could it be the thing about, um, Aries that, that I always think of is like, just being able to speak out for yourself and defend yourself and like be that, you know, uh, in the apocalypse, I'm going to take care of my, myself first. Mm -hmm. And if the moon in opposition, you know, the moon can sometimes be just your environment. And so are you at odds with your environment to be able to have that? clarity to speak out in defense of yourself. Is that going to be an opposition? There's going to be that tension point between the moon or maybe the body. Maybe you want to do something and you're sick and like your body is not letting you be that expressive or that empowered. I mean, Chiron's there still. Um, I mean, none of the, I mean, Pluto can sextile it by house, but it's not very close. It's more <clears> busy <throat> with Mercury, but I feel like it's going to be that tension between you know, Mars and the moon, they're of the same sect. So mm -hmm. they're, they're not necessarily diametrically opposed, but the, the idea of self versus the environment or the circumstances that I'm in as being the tension point that maybe causes you to feel that urge, that desire, that North node push to kind of lash out, but mm -hmm. it feels more like in a, in an expressive way, not necessarily a violent way. Um, but just like a verbally expressive way, I don't have anything astrologically to back it up. It's just kind of what, what's coming through of like, I feel like there's going to be just a lot of personal, this is who I am, what I stand for yeah. and just verbalizing it in that, that might feel antithetical to the circumstances or this, the, the environment that you're, you're saying that within. 
Absolutely. And I, you know, Mercury is pretty chill in Taurus and, Mm -hmm. um, that's not very astrological way to say that, but (laughs) it's pretty chill. Um, but I like that because, um, whenever you think of expression, you know, at least there doesn't seem to be a tendency here to express something in, like you said, a violent way. Mm -hmm. It's more, um, about just standing up for yourself maybe. And I, I kind of want to speak on malef- maleficness in general and Mars being only malefic is kind of not a- a copacetic with me. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like I need for it to be more because it is yeah. in my opinion and it's action and it's passion. And, um, oftentimes, and I think that's why it gets the malefic label whenever you have to take action or you are passionate about something, uh, especially that area in nature, you are railroading something perhaps, or just Mm. busting a wall down, you know, and it doesn't have to be um, malefic in a way that, you know, is permanently damaging, you know, it's, it's malefic in a way where, you know, necessary change again, kind of like Uranus, it's like, you're not going to, you can't just sit around and let people walk all over you, which is more malefic, you know, right. Laying down and taking it and, you know, or doing the ego thing and maybe standing up, maybe surviving, you know? So I agree with, uh, with what you're saying about it, how it doesn't feel to me like, um, not that, things won't happen in the world where you might be able to say that's Mars in the North node. Oh, that's the thing. But especially personally and like on the microcosm of our personal lives, um, it's just going to highlight maybe the direction that the eclipses are trying to send you or the Mm -hmm. direction you want to go. And yes, you have Libra and the South node being there and the moon being at the South node and feeling like, there may be a story ending there and, Mm. and that emotional acknowledgement of it. And like you said, I saw a lot of hornet's nest kicked over at the eclipse and just in that whole month and just actually in a way that I I didn't quite expect, you know, just hornet's nest after hornet's nest. And it wasn't like um, accidental. Most of these things, it's like we had to rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Most of those things. So around this time, what might revisit is, you know, maybe, an echo from that you, if you had to rip the bandaid off, you know, and had to like, maybe let someone go at your job, that person Mm -hmm. might make contact that day or something like that. I I think of it as just reminding you you're moving away from that and you're moving towards this. And yes, it may be something to deal with emotionally, but it is uh, the path forward, you know, Mm -hmm. but the, just these two placements reminds me of the the idea of um, there are, not to just put people into a binary, <clears throat> but there's people that speak directly mm-hmm. because it's like the shortest distance to the conversation is just to be like, can you take the trash out? <laughs> right. But then there are people that are hurt by that directness. There are people who are like, I would rather you say, um, wouldn't it be nice if someone took the trash out? Now that irritates me. Like, I'm like, just ask me to take the trash out. Don't circumnavigate in this non-confrontational way when we both want to say the same thing. And that's like moon and Libra at the South node is like, it's a little passive aggressive. It's, it's not confrontational. Um, it's softer, but some people need that. Mm-hmm. And the, the Mars at the North node, it's like, we have filled the trash can up. It doesn't belong there anymore. Someone has to move it. It's like those arrows of the pointedness of Mars and the the serpentine nature of the moon being like, well, wouldn't it be grand if the trash was empty, (laughs) you know? And so that tension point of those two, what is it? Is there, is there a passive aggressive, um, thing that happens that is in tension with the direct action that you Mm. want to have happen? And, and is it healthy to go into the North node area, you know, like whatever house Aries is for you, Is it going to be the right choice to be direct, to rip Mm. that bandaid off? Is it going to cause you more harm? You know, I I don't believe that the North node is always a good thing to lean into. Yeah. I don't believe Mm -hmm. the South node is always a good thing to, to avoid. So Mm -hmm. it's that, so that I would, it would be interesting because there's such softness throughout the whole month, or at least up until now, 
um, that this day might get our attention because it's kind of been easy. It's been like hammock weather. And this is the point of like, Oh, I need to get out of my hammock and like deal with the trash, you know, like the trash Mm -hmm. is, is, is now in my face. So, um, I would just be curious to see what the, what the mundane expressions are. Like you said, like things could still happen because they always happen. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with that North node Mars, you know, there's lots of conflict going on in the world as there always is, but you know, there's definitely loud ones. Now this day could be a day that really speaks to that, but on a personal level, pay attention to this day on that Sunday, just to see like, what was the tension point of that day? And was mm-hmm. I, was I empowered enough? Cause Mars and Aries is empowered. It's new, you know, it's fresh. It's been, you know, back home. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm because I'm more partial to the directness. I'm like, I, I love Mars and Aries. Uh, and so I would lean into having that empowerment, but being mindful that that empowerment could be too selfish mm-hmm. or just too like that, that runaway train and that, that kind of ripping the bandaid off when you really did need to leave it on there for yeah. a couple of days. So Put some ointment on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it might get us our attention just because it's been kind of easy, um, you know, prior to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, it also, <laughs> it's not exactly helpful that the day before the sun meets Jupiter and it kind of still is very close and Mm. people can tend to be very extra when the sun is conjoined (laughs) to Jupiter and then you have Mars the north node and then it is just all of this you know concentrated energy just like we were talking talking about last month but um this month too and now we just have a little more we're a lot more in Taurus Mm -hmm. and um and so it's heavy on just two or three places in the chart and people are going to show that in their lives. I think yeah. you'll see people just pouring themselves into something. And on this day, maybe it's also helpful to remember that. So if someone is, you know, direct or crazy or whatever, you know, everyone's being extra right now and everyone's yeah. really passionate and into the thing. And it's almost, you know, not unavoidable. I think you can work with it, but um just don't be surprised. And also the sun is sextile Neptune that day too. Oh. Um, <laughs> which just adds kind of like this, uh, maybe out of touch and uh, like, you know, sextiles are good, but, um, the sun Jupiter, <laughs> which rules Pisces mm-hmm. and sextile Neptune, it's uh, people are floating away in their own imaginations and inspirations and delusions. And Mars is like, yeah, go for it. It's so people are just, <laughs> Okay, you know, um, and and then you have the moon in and the south node in the sign that represents other people. So right. it kind of makes sense. There's going to be that interplay between what I want, what I need to do for myself, what my values are, and what other people think, feel, how they work with you, your mm. business relationships, wherever it's at. You know, um, I could see that definitely. Or even the urge to do it under the delusion that you think you're doing it for other people, but you're really doing it for yourself Mm. and and an Mm -hmm. inability to, to just, to just say that out loud. Like I, I just, I, I, I'm saying that I'm doing it for other people that sextile from Neptune to the sun to Jupiter and to Venus within five degrees, you know, they're all pretty close. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the two rulers of Pisces are, are in sextile to that Neptune And, you know, you might be under the illusion that like, well, I'm doing this for these, you know, for these values or, or these, you know, other people, you know, cause that Venus ruling that moon, but really the core of it is like, I'm doing it because I need to invite more personal empowerment and rekindle that personal fire for myself. Mm. And you might not even realize that until after, you know, um, probably when the sun moves into Gemini, you'll have that clarity of like, oh yeah, I totally just needed to do that to prove to myself that I could, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've already experienced, I think, hearing, hearing people kind of trying to hide that they, you know, maybe they're trying to make money, but, oh, I'm doing it for other people, other things. And, you know, it's funny that you said that because I think I've actually witnessed that lately, Mm -hmm. especially maybe with all the current tourists already, that's sort of happening. Um, and it's like, just be honest, like we all need to make money. It's fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> just be, say it out loud. It might actually help, you know, yeah. um, and, and be truthful about it. Uh, and because that those truths will come out. So I think being One honest, way or the other. 
<laughs> That's that is so right. Um, where are we at here? I'm gonna share the calendar again. All right. So yeah, that's uh, just the middle of the month. We've got Venus conjoining Uranus. Also add in Jupiter's sun that day. And then Mars conjoining the North Node on the 19th. And then... Can I interrupt you real quick? Yes, you so can. So on the 18th, you have that chance change thing for Venus Uranus. So yeah. I went to um, this place in Florida, the Casadega, Florida. It's like the spiritualist capital of Florida. And it came from the, um, what's that place up in New York? The spiritual capital up in, up in New York. It's the Lilydale. Oh, oh. And yeah. So they, they, they founded this like warmer climate, like retreat center for these spiritualists, like occultists, you know, in the turn of the century, the twenties, I guess, maybe even a little later, um, down in Florida to have like a warm place to gather because it gets so cold up in upstate New York. And at the, at, in Casadega, there's a cemetery that has like the devil's chair. And so whenever we travel, I always find like the weird spots to go see. <laughs> and I was like, devil's chair, like, uh, like ping, put that on my map. And so the idea is that you sit in this chair, that's part of a uh, family cemetery and the devil will whisper in your ear if you sit in the chair. And so I went and I was like, sure, you know, I'm game. And my, you know, my husband sat in it and my son sat in it. It was like Goldilocks. And then I sat in it and I kid you not, as soon as I sat in it, this thought came in, it said, take your chances, change your dances. And I, I say, and I'm like, this was back in December that it happened. And like, yes, I know what those words are. I, I've spoken English my whole life. I have heard all of those words, but I've never put them together. And it was like this, as soon as I sat down, it came into my ear. Wow. And so when I see that chance change, it feels like maybe I heard that for this moment to be like, take your chances, change your dances. You know, it's not it, when you think about like triangulation with like unhealthy relationships, if you change the way you dance within that triangulation, then you can get a different result. Right. So take a chance. It's hard to take chances through Taurus, but if you can take the chance to change your dance, then maybe that's the day to do it. So I just wanted to share that. Cause it was like, when I saw that I, I was tickled and <laughs> it spooked me and it just kind of cracks me up of like the devil did whisper in my ear and that's exactly what he told me. <laughs> oh my God. That is so perfect too. The imagery of Venus. Yeah. I mean, dancing just mm -hmm. fits right there with it. So Oh, that's beautiful. Take your chances, change your dances, mm -hmm. put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> Logging into Canva right now. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful um, imagery for that. I will actually probably remember that for the rest of my life. I tend to hold on to phrases like that yeah, and yeah. just remember them consistently throughout the rest of my life. So well, it'll be, it'll be on my tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> you actually you didn't know. your ghost from the future, that's like it. flying through like the cemetery, um, like freeway to be like, this is what I want. Tell I'm me. the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Scorpio. That's what they say. Um, <laughs> so speaking of where the sun is, it's going into Gemini. Which is honestly, that's a very Gemini thing to happen to. And you have Gemini in your chart, right? I only have a lot of Eros and Gemini. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So Gemini, I have the North Node and Chiron. So I have a funny relationship with Gemini. So I'm constantly seeking out Geminis, I think, mm -hmm. in my life. And seeking out, you know, what is this Gemini thing? Um and this, that message, for instance, felt very Gemini to me. And I was mm -hmm. like, maybe you have Gemini and you can tell me, does it? But it feels like a message, Gemini and Pisces and the square between them is very much a whispered message from somewhere, you know, yeah. so the sun. Similarly, sun every single one of my closest best friends, like from my first best friend was born uh, 19 days after me and she's Gemini and my like neighborhood best friend was born on my dad's birthday is Gemini. And my best friend from when I was 20 until the present day is Gemini. I have always attracted Gemini, like very close besties. And, um, I, you know, I'm Scorpio rising. So I always feel like I am an ambassador for Scorpio to be like, we're not 
Scorpios are not to be disparaged. You're, you're really, you know, <laughs> you're really yeah. taking your chances by like disparaging Scorpio. <laughs> um, but I feel like Scorpio Gemini get kind of the most flack in all of the astrology. I mean, every sign gets flack. Like you can just mm -hmm. be like, Oh my God, Capricorns. But, but those two Gemini and Scorpio really do get the most heat. And I've never really understood why, because like, I mean, I get Gemini is duplicitous. It's two faced mm -hmm. by nature. It's double bodied. All of the mutable signs are double bodied. Even Virgo, the early depictions of Virgo, where it was a woman with bird wings, you know, they're mm. all double bodied. That's not, I mean, it can feel disingenuous, but really it's like that the butterfly that flutters by that is the Gemini. It's just finding new information and, and being able to float around. It's such a foil to Taurus. That's, I think mm. that's why I love it so much is because it's just, it's fresh air. It's fresh air from on the farm that is Taurus. It's like Gemini comes and it's like, let's just be the butterflies and the bees that pollinate all of the Taurus form. Um, so I don't have an answer of, of, you know, why you attract Gemini's. I don't have an answer of why I attract them or I am attracted to them. I just am here to give some love to Gemini. Cause I feel like it just gets disparaged uh, unfairly. Absolutely. Yep. My best friend is a Gemini and, uh, yeah, the person I was hanging out with last night, she's a Gemini and was talking about how, how what is this astrology thing? And, and why do I know so many people of this side? And I was like, I don't, I mean, I, I'll explain it to you, but it's gonna take yeah, you're going to have to sit down a while. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't have that long. It's funny that this gets brought up because she is a Gemini and she was wondering why she is attracted to Scorpios. I don't know what it is there, but you're right. There is a thing, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, it is the trickster, you know, and I think maybe um, the reason we all have Gemini best friends is because they're the only ones out there moving around and talking to people. Like you said, they're the <laughs> They're the butterflies and the bees. Yeah. Um, they're, they're just out there. Gemini's are always just, you, you'll find one in a crowd. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I had this, like them. this, I'm in a Mercury, a Gemini perfection year right now. And so I've had these, like these messages, these like mercurial thoughts that come through. And the other day I was like, just, I don't know where it came from. Cause I don't know where any of them come from, but I was like, if Gemini's were parents, they would name their kid bestie. Cause it's like, they are besties with everybody. <laughs> Like if you had one named it to, you know, you don't, don't give a Gemini the choice to say, you're going to name your child. One thing it'd be like bestie. Every person mm -hmm. they meet is a bestie. Bestie or friend. Mm -hmm. Hey friend. Um, <laughs> uh, when is your birthday? May the 12th. Ah, I knew we passed. I was like, I know it's on this calendar <laughs> somewhere. So, yeah, oh, so look I, at you with the rainbow close to your birthday. That's well, nice. I'm going into a ninth house year and, and last week. I was like, I don't want to wake up at home on my birthday. Like that just really bums me out. Like, uh, you know, I was going to host like a, like a, a all girl craft party and, you know, just have all my besties over. And I was like, boring. I've done that before. <laughs> I did not want to do that. And so I got a wild hair as you do. And, uh, I bought tickets up to New York city. So I'm going to go up to New York and I'm going to wake up in a faraway land on my birthday for my ninth house year. I was like, just going to go for the wow. weekend and I'm just going to enjoy it and be a tourist. And I wanted to just be far away. It was like that pull that, that pull to be somewhere else so that I could ha kind of begin that year at, as like the journey. So, um, yeah, my, my solar return this year is nice. I've got, I'm in a ninth house cancer year. And then my solar return chart is a cancer rising. So I've got, I'm going to have a lot more lunar themes as opposed to the mercurial messages, I'll get the lunar messages instead. So oh, I love it. I love it. And, you know, um, just to bring it back around to messages and whispers, there is a hallway in what is the, the famous train station? Grand Central. York. Yes. Yeah. There's a, a, the hallway that you can put your ear to the corner and someone else can be in the other corner and it's built where you can hear whispers. Oh, so awesome. make sure to visit that. You know, it, that's, I, I love travel yeah. and it actually goes right along with the theme of the sun and Gemini because Gemini and Sagittarius have these travel, um, I guess, associations, Gemini more about short trips, you know, yeah. um, Sagittarius more about foreign travel, but, uh, I think it's right. It's perfect. You're going into a ninth house year. You're right there, right before Gemini season. You'll probably come back with all these new ideas, the sun yeah. moon at the Gemini feeling like you got out. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. 
I'm Yay. excited. Happy early birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so the so, tw- yeah, yes, the sun was into Gemini. Mercury still in Taurus, we should say, because um, that is the ruler. And I'm such a fan of chasing rulers down. I want to know where the mm-hmm. ruler of the sun is and, and things like that. So Mercury still in Taurus, also answering to Venus. So even the sun in Gemini is still a Venus story for mm-hmm. for a little bit. Um, and actually, a couple of days after that is the the grand finale of May is really not, but this is one of the more beautiful things. Venus conjoins Jupiter. It actually happens at 3 a.m. on um the 20 the 22nd going into the 23rd. So it's technically the 23rd. Yeah. But that's the exact conjunction. So I feel like the 22nd, you're already like if you're looking to do something this month, mm-hmm. I would use you could use both days. And yeah. The better part, though, I think the better moment would be maybe the 23rd because it's a full moon in Sagittarius, which is ruled by Jupiter and Jupiter and Venus will be together. And then right after that, Venus moves into Gemini. So you have this yeah. window of the 22nd, 23rd and on the 23rd, let me on look Jupiter's up. day too. on Jupiter's day. I just I have been looking forward to this for probably two years. I think, (laughs) I don't know why, but like a long, long time. Um, and let me go ahead and show the, the chart. This is the full moon chart. It's full at 8 53 AM central, 9 53 Eastern, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see Venus and Jupiter are still very close together. So what Mm -hmm. you've got is a full moon ruled by Jupiter conjoined to Venus and her home sign. It is the luckiest day of the year. It is yeah, like, yeah. this is the best day of the year. If you're going to look at it. So, you know, this, put, so this is the, the rising for this chart for your location is Aries. No, it's, it's cancer. um okay. cancer. Yeah. I went ahead and made it zero Aries because the chart will move crazy if I don't, but it's cancer, yeah. which is really badass for, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a great, I mean, surely this is the electional moment for a ton of astrologers. Yeah. There's, yeah. I don't, think, there's not much bad at all in this chart. You can't say that very often. I mean, yes, the malefics are still there. Yes, Mars is still in Aries. But I mean, to mitigate all bad aspects, this is one of the better, and the sun's trying Pluto. It's making what I like to call a painter's knife. I like that. Um, but I guess even in my location, well, even just MC, looking at, yeah. yeah, I mean like the idea for elections, like you, you prefer not to have the malefics on an angle. So, yes. you know, even having a fixed, you know, rising, um, keeps those off the angles, but it has Pluto there. So it, that's a nice little revolutionary moment, but there we um, go. There's the yeah. MC and Pisces kind of off the angle there. I mean, personally, I, I love, uh, Sagittarius full moon. Mm. My tradition is to always make Florida water on Sagittarius full moon. Um, there's lots of recipes for it, but the idea it's, it's a protective flower water and you're in Gemini season and the, the, the Jupiter ruled moon there just really amplifies it. So, um, if you're interested at all, just Google it, how to make Florida water and it's worth it to make it on that day. And that's such a great election to do it. Um, right before having that anoretic degree of Venus and Taurus is just sexy too. I love, oh, yeah. I love that. With it both be, with both benefics. I yeah. mean, I just, you know, if it were a Mars Venus conjunction, I'd kind of be like, oh, I don't know, anoretic, but like, <laughs> yeah. this is like, wow. Yeah. Uh, and Honestly, you it, probably most people, and I know some people might not, but that just probably reflects exactly what is going on in their lives. But I already have things that have materialized on that weekend mm. and keep doing it without yeah. me planning it. Yeah, you know, I do too. it's insane. In fact, yeah. I, I'm getting my, my permanent front teeth <laughs> because they were busted out in the really crappy astrology that led up to it. But, yeah. but that's scheduled for May 22nd. And I didn't plan that. And I'm like, wow, you know, like you can't, you really can't choose those dates. I mean, you can sometimes if you have someone who'll work with you, but I had to take it and I was like, May 22nd done. Like I know what's going on and let's do it. So, and then we we're playing, my band's playing a gig at the caverns in Tennessee 
um, which is a really cool venue and it's a pretty good opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That is beautiful. Pretty good opportunity. And my partner's moon is six degrees of Gemini. So there's going to be during when we're playing, which is Sunday, Venus will be in the same sign and everything. I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah. And I think most people have kind of an inkling of something going on around that Mm -hmm. weekend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of clients. A lot of the clients that have been coming to me have had moments where it's like, wow, this, this weekend, you know, the 23rd, 24th are like really great days for your chart, like really great days for your chart. And then it's like, I think it's just a good day, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, yes, it is also speaking to them, but, but, um, you know, because a lot of these have, these people have Gemini placements, um, or Virgo placements. Those have been coming, the mercurial placements have been coming to me, but, um, yeah, I just think that it's, it's just nice. And it's funny, like the plans that have been made months in advance for this night for me directly relating to the Jupiter Uranus conjunction, Mm. um, which is like a closing of a story, which I'm really happy about, you know, happy to, to relinquish and move, be able to flow forth and move on, um, Mm. it's happening that night. And yeah, if you're going to play around with the election, I would just, I would look at, um, I would look at at it carefully and be okay with, um, wherever the malefics are going to be mm-hmm. keeping them off the angle if you can, but you're going to have Pluto on the angle if you do a fixed rising. So exactly. It's like, yeah, you got Mars and Saturn there that while that's happening are just going to be crazy. So there's lots of, I mean, I think no matter what, uh, most of that is going to, um, I'm just looking I, th- I think no matter what, it's going to be, good it's hard to choose about and even though even with maleficus on the angles i think it's like it's just so good it's just yeah. so good and you know saturn in the seventh house is not always a bad thing you know sometimes you need those that structure in right. relationships and those boundaries and clarity and boundaries and relationships so it's not always a bad thing it's just um something to consider so true i mean and honestly with um taurus and and Pisces being sextile, I think that's helpful. Mars probably is one of those to watch for. Maybe they're close to Chiron. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting. I was just kind of looking forward um, because Venus does move into Gemini um, overnight, basically. Or actually, I think it's what time is it? It's like, you know, they're going to be in Tisha to Pluto. I just saw that. Yeah. We'll see how that maybe that just I mean, I like Venus Pluto yeah. touch points. Um, but had Jupiter, you know, having, a, 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 sorry, they're going to be contra and Tisha. So the contra and Tisha is that kind of secret opposition. Um, and, but that tension point of Pluto and Venus, you know, to me, it's like, that's what brought forth Frida Kahlo and mm-hmm. yes, it was hard for her, but ultimately it's just been this lifeblood of beauty and darkness that we still appreciate. So for um, sure. Um, and then, you know, it's funny too, because Venus then trines Pluto, right? Like as soon as right. it moves into G- Gemini. So Venus, Pluto is, it's just kind of like enveloped in both of those mm-hmm. days mm-hmm. and in different ways. Um, the trines more, you know, and I think that's something to look out for. What is that moment with the contra and Tisha that changes to clarity or something yeah. like that, you know, yeah. or support yeah, or support. And then the moon having been full so early in Sagittarius, the next day we'll get a square to Saturn, a trine to Mars first, and then a square to Saturn <laughs> uh, just right after. So it's yeah. like, you know, and I can see that playing out, you know, in my own plans, I suppose, because like we have to play this big gig and we're going up for the whole weekend. We're going to have to go like, you know, make sure all our gear is packed and all of this stuff and the work and the, um, the output of Mars trine Mars and the obstacle of, uh, uh, moon trine Mars moon square Saturn, Mm -hmm. um, comes through already for me in my mind and my own plans and what might be going on. Um, yeah. In order for this to be your environment and circumstances, the moon, like you have to kind of go through the gauntlet of making sure everything's in order Mm. so that you can, because that's part of it. You know, the restrictions allow you to kind of channel that energy into the environment, the fun Sagittarian environment that you, that you want to happen. So Mm. what was next on the list? That's a, that's such a great, great moment though. Just don't, don't sleep on that people. 
That's also um, Bob Dylan's birthday. There. <laughs> I listened to Tangled it Up in Blue right before we started. That's so oh, funny. nice. I love it. I actually kind of thought that that's what this month sort of, it was giving me that, that whatever that feeling that yeah. song gives me. Yeah, it just was. Um, and and then, you know, Jupiter moving into Gemini after that. Pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Lego guys that like make the pew, pew sound. That's, that's Jupiter and Gemini. Too. Oh, it's so true. Oh, and I just, you know, things, you know, whatever calm there may or may not have been in your life, uh, just get ready. I think is probably a good thing to say because it won't probably won't kick off immediately. Yes. You will have Jupiter and Venus and the sun all in Gemini, but it's all answering to Mercury still in Taurus. So, and I mean, I guess Mercury and Venus being in mutual reception, there's, um, not mutual reception, Yes, mutual reception. Mercury rules Gemini, Venus rules Taurus. Um, yeah, there's another phrase for it because they can't see each other by line of sight. It's like, I forget what it's called, but it's like they're in each other's domiciles, but they can't see each other by traditional aspects. So there's like another word for it and I can't ever remember. Mm. But they are in mutual reception just without the line of sight. It's like yes, complementary or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when, but when Mercury goes, because Jupiter's not at home there, it's an exile. Mm, that's right yes it has to like rely on the host and the host is gemini or sorry the host is still in taurus so it's like um you know i have jupiter in mercury sign virgo and so you know any sign that's not at home it has to it is forced to be resourceful right it's like Mm. necessity is the mother of invention and so jupiter won't be able to express itself in like a familiar way it's going to be an unfamiliar way because it's going to have to just play around and and that's a you know outside of leo i don't know a better sign to play in except gemini so yeah i think you're right about that and and um i think it's about gathering the information and listening and taking in i mean i i feel like sagittarius is more of a knowledge and yes you share knowledge in Gemini I think that's part of it but also just the receiving of it with Jupiter there receiving Mm -hmm. the knowledge because Jupiter likes to know Jupiter knows its truth Mm -hmm. Jupiter out in the opposite sign of where it rules is going to have to learn something you know and that may be uncomfortable and having to listen or even having to communicate when you just wish people would know how to do it already or whatever Um, I could also that. see this, like just repeating what you hear, like having the information mm-hmm. come in and just saying it out loud because it's in a, it's in mercury sign without the wisdom. And I think we'll, we'll get better at that as the ingress of Jupiter into Gemini happens, but I, that's something that I do think can influence just the mundane world of, okay, we look at deep fakes and we look at AI and we look at, you know, fake news and all that, but we are also participants in our own story. And so by hearing information, hearing information and just repeating it without any sort of discernment, Mm -hmm. slowing it down so that it can be more helpful. I feel like we're all going to have like foot and mouth disease (laughs) with Jupiter and Gemini, that that's what we'll learn. And we'll learn to be a bit more discerning and that to not believe everything that we think and not believe everything that we hear, but to kind of process it in, in a little bit more of a um, judicious way, you know? Um, but I also think it's going to be funny. I think there's going to be like great comedy that comes out of Jupiter and Gemini. (laughs) I agree. I completely agree. And, um, I have Jupiter and Sagittarius. It'll be my Jupiter opposition. Mm. Uh, I think it's funny. We both have mutable Jupiters. Um, but when I think of my experience of Jupiter and Sagittarius, um, I, I, it's the opposites um, attract kind of thing. It's the same side or two sides of the same coin Mm -hmm. to me. And I think um, Jupiter will express itself as Sagittarian through Gemini in some strange way. Like, I think you can kind of both of those feed each other, right? So there is the knowledge and then there is the learning. You have to have the learning to have the knowledge. So the two, two sides to the same coin, really comes out with Jupiter and Gemini, I think, especially yeah. because Gemini is the double face, you know, the <laughs> twins, of course. And I think it just really um, maybe shines a light on 
the things we think we know as well. And like, uh, or the truths that we thought we had the truth of, you know, like you just said, AI and all that, the truth of someone on a video, what is that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and, and personal responsibility comes up as well to me, especially knowing there's going to be a square to Saturn eventually, um, as we get into the fall from Jupiter and, and a Mercury retrograde at the same time, the ruler of Gemini. So you start to see where, yes, it's going to be hilarious. And I'm excited for that. I'm not excited for the, the, the maybe yank back from Saturn on the leash, right. you know, everyone's being funny and having fun and going crazy and whatever. And then Saturn squares is like, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like Jupiter rules that Saturn. So true. You know, it, Very it, true. You know, I'm not saying that it, it won't like a Saturn square is I'm not, I'm not <laughs> adding that to my bucket list or anything, but having it be yeah. Jupiter itself, it's like, here's a total teachable moment. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I also just think about, okay, well, where is it in your chart? Where is Gemini in your chart? And think about, you know, the expansiveness of Jupiter through Taurus and like, how will that express through the air sign that is Gemini in the house that, that Gemini rules and, you know, you know, reflection is a great way to just kind of consider that. So I would just look at your Gemini house, like mm-hmm. for cancer risings, you know, having uh-huh. it in the, <clears throat> in the 12th house, like, what does that mean? Is that like a, that connection to that subconscious and this communication to the the other realms, right. Um, you know, like for, for Taurus risings, you know, like they're the resources, the ideas that come through for resource building or, um, financial opportunities, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's ways to kind of play around with it. That Saturn square though, might be that teachable moment that helps really pivot you towards the direction before then. I feel like it might be a little, just kind of, uh, like a, like a potluck of meals. And then after the Saturn square, you're like, you know what? I'm going to just focus on this one dish and I'm going to really put my yeah. ideas for that. in that one dish, that one, that one energy channel, I think the Saturn square is probably going to reel us in, in a teachable way that might, we might actually welcome, <laughs> yeah. you know, having just been like all of the ideas. My, one of my, um, close high school friends, Najina was like, don't ever give me two options. Always give me three. <sighs> always give me three, give me th- a third that I can just defer to because I will get stuck in the loop of the two options as Gemini son. She was just like, just get, don't give me two colors. Give me three colors. So I have a way out. Like she knew in her mind, she could never do that. And when we were talking about Mars earlier, when you have, when you make a decision, you are cutting away the other things that you're not choosing. And that can be really, that can feel harmful. It's like by choosing this person, I'm, I'm deciding that the other people are not going to be chosen. And that's, mm-hmm. that's hard, but ultimately that's a good thing. That's why malefics say no to things. They, they restrict or they sever for good, you know, that for, for movement. Otherwise we would just be like job of the hut, just like blobs of nothing that doesn't do anything. You know I mean? Um, it's funny yeah. because Mars, uh, and this is, uh, August, September timeframe I'm talking about, I believe August is Mars yeah. will be with Jupiter during yeah. that Saturn square. It's just funny that you brought up Mars and the cutting oh, yeah. part of that, because it will be part of the equation in Gemini with Jupiter. So, well, wow, yeah. and you know, not to get too far ahead, but I think it's helpful to frame up months that way. Like, okay, May mm-hmm. is this. But in August, you know, there is this and it's, yeah. it's a lot different. And so you have Jupiter moving into Gemini and I guess immediately you could say it's going to be sign based square to Saturn. Right. So, you know, watch it when the moon comes through when the mm-hmm. moon squares Saturn and Gemini and things like that, as you lead up to this moment, when there may be a choice. I mean, I think that when you brought up that story about the three choices rather yeah. than two, it, it does seem to me that maybe in August there will be a choice, but all of that comes out of the fertile ground. It's like you have to thin the seedlings, you know, like right. you can't just let it all grow. It all yeah. drowns each other out. So Jupiter and Gemini, there will be a lot, but don't let it overwhelm you too much because there's going to be a moment when that gets thinned out or um, you have to kind of choose or something. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, you know, take that, that Mars with the North node earlier as like, 
it's, it's often good to make the choice yourself instead of having it placed upon you. Mm-hmm. Cause usually mm-hmm. when it's placed upon you, you don't feel like you have empowerment or agency in that decision. And, and yes, you have the responsibility. If you make a decision, it falls on your shoulders to, you know, of whatever the repercussions are, but that in itself becomes your own empowerment. It's like, yeah, I made that decision. It was hard. And I, I still made it. I didn't wait for it to just happen to me. Um, lean into that part of it, as opposed to the, the South known moon circumstances of like, I just am not a fan of, of just surrendering in the form of giving up, (laughs) but surrender to like the moment is calling me to make this, this decision. And, um, maybe we can hold on to that Mars North node, like agency a little bit more when we're in that Jupiter Gemini of like, I know what it feels like to be empowered and make the choice. And yes, it's hard, but I'm going to kind of trust that, that empowerment to kind of carry me through so I can play around with the Jupiter Gemini, but I can also be, um, self-empowered with that Aries. Cause Aries Gemini like, they like each other just like, they do. like Pisces and Taurus get along with it through that sextile Aries Gemini and I get along through that sextile. So, mm-hmm. and Jupiter will be trining Pluto as soon as it moves in. So there's another, um, I guess thing that can prop us up or empower us with the trying to Pluto right off the bat yeah. for uh, like two days, I think is what it does. Uh, and then right after that, Mercury and Taurus will sextile Saturn and Pisces. So, um, as Jupiter moves into Gemini and gets this trine to Pluto and there it's working with the Aries energy as well. We also have the Taurus and Pisces energy working together (laughs) at the same time. So it's kind of nice. I mean, I don't think, um, right off the bat, you know, I did mention the sign base square. I don't really think that's going to come through too heavily until Jupiter gets at least into maybe the second decade of, of Gemini. Um, this but it happens around quick. 18. It's in the middle decan right now. Right. Mm-hmm. And let's just go ahead and take a look. Let's pull up the chart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Let me go month ahead. Whoop. I'm crazy with it. Okay. So right now it is, yes, it's in, um, it's, it's at 16. So if we go yeah. way far forward to when Jupiter moves into Gemini, it's at 18. Yeah by that point. Um, and let me just, um, play with this because I want to just go look at August because I wanted to show very quickly why I was talking about that in this moment. Mm. And it's interesting because it's going Jupiter and Mars will square Saturn at about the 18th degree where Mm. Saturn is during Jupiter's ingress into Gemini. So if you look at it that way, it's definitely linked to me. Saturn will be at the same degree um, when it squares Jupiter as when Jupiter moves into that sign. So, and it'll be retrograde too. Yep. At that point. Yes. And I wonder when let's go ahead and take a little look, see it when Saturn goes retrograde, because that's going to be something June 29th. So, Okay. Yeah. So retrograde is at 19. So it's pretty slow right now. Uh, Even right now, it's only got three degrees to go from today. Right. So it's retrograde degree. So wow, that takes a while. So yeah, Saturn's pretty much sitting there at, you know, that middle 18, 19 degree Mm -hmm. while Jupiter's moving towards squaring it. So that's interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, and then I guess the last thing we have is, uh, what did I have? It was, oh, Chiron, Mars Chiron. That's what it was. And here it is. It's, um, actually I think exact the 29th. So yeah. And it's at 22, which I find pretty significant because that's where the eclipse, the eclipse is at 20 or was the North node during the eclipse? Is it 15? Um, well, no, during the eclipse, wasn't it? They were, was it 22? I thought they were at 19. <laughs> I'm so bad. This is, I'm telling you, hold on, let me look. Cause that, then the node would have been, Oh, the node was 15. 15. Okay. okay. Mercury was 24. Chiron oh, was... Ner- that's right. Mercury. I mean, Chiron was 19. It was so much. It was so much. <laughs> glad we have <laughs> this to remind us like, Oh, yeah, oh my gosh. Definitely this. I can't. Yeah. I In can't. In my head, it was like 21, but 
I don't know why. Uh, maybe because the, the Jupiter Uranus was at 21, 21, 49. I, I also like 22. I'm a 22 degree sun. I like so oh, 22 yeah, yeah. sticks yeah. out. So I saw this and I was like, but I think it may have been, there was something I was listing out the Mars Chiron conjunctions, I think. And there was something mm-hmm. with 22 that stood up to me. Um, either way, I think this moment's interesting specifically because the eclipse was with Chiron. Mm-hmm. And um, I know just like working with Pluto, some people do or don't work with Chiron. I do love Chiron. I think it's so wonderful to imagine learning to heal something about yourself and then helping mm-hmm. to heal that in the world, which is what yeah. I think ultimately Chiron encompasses. But I also think that means there is a sensitive point with Chiron. There's a wound there. Um, and so I think this could be sensitive, you know, it could be a reminder that this area is something we're working on, you know, whatever mm-hmm. that is. Um, and I can and it's tap like a into month and it. a half after the eclipse, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. April 8th. To, yep. About a month and a half. So, and Mars being, um, the ruler of Aries, the eclipse was, was in Aries. It's almost like, uh, Mars coming out of Pisces because it was there for the uh, Aries mm. North node eclipse mm-hmm. into into this its home side and, and almost like like what the hell happened here yeah. you know like yeah I've got to you know patch up the hole you left in the wall or yeah, something I just, like that it feels like it, it will revert back to okay well the eclipse most people if you did something you might remember it's hard to think of like okay today is May 2nd yeah where were you a month and a half ago I'm like uh, I don't know uh-huh. but if you're like where were you during the eclipse on this day on May 29th, if you can, you can hold that eclipse date of like what happened on that day. I can remember if it was auspicious for a lot of people, just because it was an eclipse, we could see it in the States. If you could remember back to that, you might be able to tie in without having to revert back to your, you know, dur- your journal, your email threads or what your text threads to find out what happened on that day. I just feel like this might be, yeah, it might be a revisitation or, um, a, an energizing of that that Chiron energy, um, Mm. having, having, um, Mars there at that 22nd. I agree. And, um, I really, you know, Mars being what it is, it's a malefic, it can cause trouble, um, but it can also make you take action. And that's what I I like to, I just can't subscribe to the only malefic viewpoint, Mm. um, especially when it does something now with Chiron, that gets tricky. I mean, it could, it could smart a little bit, but I mean, I think Chiron's job is to expose the places of maybe infection or Mm -hmm. something like that. And especially with Mars there, it's like, Hey, I can't take it anymore. I've got to freeze this wart off, you know, like it's got to go. And that it feels like that in that moment, just putting myself in that place, you know, um, and what that is. I know that personally speaking at, for the eclipse, I, I can't believe I actually made it happen. I told you I was going to go to this giant guitar and actually we didn't plan on it, but the next day we realized the tra- traffic wise, that was going to be the best place to go in the yeah. most open area. So I ended up doing what I kind of jokingly said I was going to do. I yeah. watched the eclipse from a giant guitar and they also had, um, Abbey road park. They had a Beatles park. It was like this little music town yeah. in Arkansas. It was insane. Um, so we were there And I, you know, I had this thought like, wow, what, what, how cool is this? And I'm on, you know, a giant guitar. And then we went back to the hotel. It was just the traffic after was Mm. absolutely horrible. We decided to leave and um, we got home very late and just the overwhelming feeling I got from that whole weekend was super strange. It was Mm. some really cool And some really like, what the hell am I doing in this place? Because it, you know, like this lady, we ate barbecue and she walked up to us. She's like, y'all aren't from around here. Uh, No, we're, we're absolutely not. You'll probably see a lot of people now, but it just felt like this whole identity thing. I mean, I'm from Alabama, Alabama and Arkansas are very similar and it still ended up showing me what I felt about myself and my, the Mm struggles I was having with identity and being a musician and I was on this guitar and I was thinking about it. And this happens to be the weekend after we play this really big gig for us, for our band anyway. Yeah. Um, And I think about the, the way those two weekends might coincide and the feeling of, am I being true to myself? 
um, or whatever the Aries identity Mm -hmm. or independence or whatever that is and um, how that could correlate. So I totally agree. I, I agree that you should maybe try to hold those themes in your heart and think about it because I can already see for myself how that's probably going to play out like yeah. a weekend after a gig where I'll probably be self-conscious. Did I do okay? You mm-hmm. know, things like that coming up. I think it's a very safe bet for that mm. to, to be a theme. Well, and especially because Aries is your 10th house, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for me specifically, and, and I, it's very clear when it happens, I think in the upper part of the chart, a lot of times, you know, like what it just seems to show itself, but yeah. Um, like I have a friend, uh, my best friend, Gemini rising. Um, I'm sorry. She's a Gemini son, but she's a Capricorn rising opposite mm-hmm. and she's building a home Yeah, and it just passed, it passed inspection at the eclipse and they're probably going to be moving in or having a party around this time. And yeah. that's fourth house for her home, you know, and yeah. I see how clearly you can delineate this. And I think it's because of the specific signs, because it was so much focused energy. It's really easy to say, Oh, you're a Virgo rising. Well, here it was in this, you know, this area Mm -hmm. of your chart. And they'll be like, yeah, I mean, I decided to go with a business partner. It was in my eighth house, you know? Yeah. It's just so clear. At least I think so. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please leave comments about what it's like for you. We want to hear all the stories. I, that's what I thrive off of is the stories that go along with the astrology and oh, how man. It... astrologers are like vampires for stories. We're like, no, tell me, tell me, <laughs> please. Oh. My lifeblood depends on it. Um, uh, the other th- other thing to, that I always like as an ambassador of Mars is that, you know, Mars re- really requires sacrifice, personal sacrifice. It's not sacrifice of another, Um, there's no cheating with it. It's like, it requires blood in the symbolic sense. And so is there something in the Aries house that is going to ask you to be self-sacrificial for the greater cause, the greater cause of your life, it can still Mm -hmm. be self-serving, but I feel like there's something that Mars is like, okay, well, if you want this, it's going to hurt, but you need to sacrifice X, Y, Z, you know, it's going to require something like that's the price that you pay to the ferryman to cross the river. And that mm-hmm. it's like, if you want to cross the river, this is what Mars is asking you. And it's not to not asking you to be mean or to be malefic. It's asking, it's like you, I'm not just Venus. I'm not going to give you shit. Like you mm-hmm. have to earn it. You have mm-hmm. to earn it alone of, of, from your own volition, not, not as a gift from daddy, not as like, you know, sliding in the, the door as it's closing on someone else. It's you it's sacrificial. And it, and that makes it that it's worth it for you. Like you remember I sacrificed to do this, you know, I, my blood is in this game. And so again, it's the long game. It, it becomes beneficial, but it has that prick initially and having the Chiron there as that wound with the Mars that was requiring sacrifice. Like it may not be an easy thing to choose, but it, it should be worth it if you're doing it for like that, the, the, the long game in mind. Um, I would just say like, don't shy away from the sacrificial part of it because sacrifice in itself can be a really beautiful thing if it's Mm -hmm. not, um, abused, you know, you don't want to obviously go down that road too much, but don't, don't veer away from it. Um, again, it still reminds me of that, the North node and Mars of like, Mm. just say the thing, you know? Yeah, I think you're right about that. And I, I feel like I've witnessed it. I'm in a Mars perfection year right now. And I mean, that's, it's been a theme. I have Mars and Virgo, like we were talking about earlier. And even during my third house, Mercury, Virgo year, Mars was a theme. And I feel like at least in my own life, I've been sacrificing from that moment forward. Like I, mm-hmm. I belong to a bunch of boards I do a lot of volunteer work. And I, ca- I came to this head with this Mars year, like, is this good for my career or not? And then, yeah. you know, I think I've gotten a clear yes, which still requires more sacrifice. I have to sacrifice mm-hmm. my time. I mean, I get paid for it. I don't know. I hope I do. Um, but I do think it will end up being a, a thing that does pay me back, but it does require the sacrifice. So I completely see that association with Mars and sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like, 
sometimes other people will be Mars to you as well. And you may be something that if you haven't sacrificed for something, you may get let go or Mm something. And that will be your Mars moment. And, Mm -hmm. but it answers something for you. It always answers something for you. And it may be something painful in the moment. And then you go, wait a minute. I didn't really want to be doing that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So whether, you know, whether you're actively doing the Mars thing or just you're someone else is Mars for you or something mm-hmm. is Mars to you, I do think e- your imagery is spot on with that sacrifice. Um, yeah. Picture. And just on the, the <clears throat> other end of it, I'm reminded of, you know, I've, I've been in management like my whole life, I've, you know, I've always managed people. <clears throat> you can see my chart and, and, and you'll know it if you're an astrologer of why I manage other people. Um, but part of that is that I've had to fire a lot of people. I, I've hired every single one of them and I fired most of them. Mm-hmm. And, and oftentimes I haven't fired most of them. The ones that I've had to fire have been fired. A lot I don't of hire them unless I fire them. <laughs> but I say like to actually fire somebody, it's, it's, it's hard to do. Even uh-huh. in the moment, it might seem cool on our end it's because we've gone through a lot to get to that point Mm -hmm. right and there's one person that I had to fire and you know I would lament my own personal um difficulty with it because I don't want to be the bearer of bad news Mm -mm. but I also um know that like they can't stay and a a trusted friend was like their soul is asking you for this that's what they said it was like they do not want to stay in this job at all And they're acting out in a way that they do not want to be here and their soul is asking for it and they are incapable of doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you are being put in the position to make that for them. And I've seen this person completely blossom. (laughs) Like it's, it's been 15 years, but they are a blossomed person compared to the person that I fired. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I was just put in the position to do that and because they were incapable of doing it themselves. And so Again, harness that Chiron Mars, harness that Mars North node to not put it in someone else's hands because your soul is asking for it. When your soul asks for something, you should listen to it yourself and you make that action because it's like, it just expedites joy for you, you know, just run through that fire so that you can get to the joy on the other end of that fire. Yeah. And it's hard. I recently had a moment where, but it it was the same thing. In fact, I had another person say this, I think they want this, Hmm. you know, and I had them say the same thing. And I think something that's worth noting is that Venus is under the beams at this Hmm. point. So combust. um, And it is, um, close to Kazemi, but it's still going to take a minute because yeah. it, it happens at the new moon, um, the Venus star point. But I think also that might play into th- maybe the strength of Mars at this moment. And the, you know, I guess it depends on what school, astrological school of thought you come from, how how much combust plays into you know, a, a planet's strength or not. Right. So having Venus there by the sun, it just, it does seem a little harder to access the, um, relational, um, peace maybe, mm-hmm. or the, the ability for that. Um, so yeah, I can see how this moment, maybe Venus is not as helpful as, yeah. especially with, I'll just look at the moon as an Aquarius. She's busy. <laughs> yeah. The moon's about to square Venus too after that. <laughs> she is busy. She's um, busy. yeah. And let, let's go ahead and take a look at Mercury. Uranus, because that happens. Okay. Did I, do I have that on my calendar? I think so at the end. You know what? I didn't put the 31st on there. Maybe that's why I don't, <laughs> I don't have it on because I don't even have the number 31 on my calendar. It so does not exist. it does not exist. You heard it. Okay. Gemini, 31st of months do not exist. <laughs> yeah. That's not, quit talking crazy. Um, Yeah. So May 31st, which uh, I will tweak that before I put it, you know, somewhere cool like YouTube. Actually, that's a joke. It's going right up. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I love that the Jupiter Pluto trine is awesome. Yes. I I really, really love that one. Absolutely. And, you know, where's uh, the Mercury being the ruler of Gemini, which is combust and being with Uranus makes me kind of laugh. Like I'm giggling right now thinking Mm. about it. 
because it's just such volatile energy and then yeah. trying to Pluto, which is Did um, someone say volatility. <laughs> Right. There is like, uh, okay. So, Hello. you know, as um, there's no red lines, I think that's funny. There's mm-hmm. nothing technically square at this moment. Um, sign base. Yes. The moon has just squared the sun. It's the third quarter square just after it. Um, but I imagine this day changes some things i would just imagine there's nothing else except for mars that has to touch uranus for quite a while and i mean by conjunction by conjunction yeah um so this is the last planet until mars and then once mars conjoins it in july by the way which is probably the last um hurrah for um uranus conjunctions which i think are very pinpoint accurate i I watch uranus conjunctions Mm -hmm. more than a lot of things um mars uranus will be probably pretty volatile but mercury uranus with everything in gemini just about Mm -hmm. seems to be uh competing with it i think yeah i mean like this i think just this speaks to you know when mercury mercury and mars come together Um, or when Mercury and Mars came together and then like the continuous st- story of that Mercury Uranus. I mean, I just feel like, um, Uranus can just be that higher translator of, of, of other information that comes through, um, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Um, but I like, I like these two together just because like they both feel chatty. No, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Uranus just speaks with lightning bolts versus just, you know, a voice. <laughs> I'm thinking of May 31st and what, like, there's no holidays. It's after Memorial Day. Um, and what in the world, like, is you know, it may, that weekend? Do you, you may be right because. Or is it the weekend prior? Let's see. Let me just take a little look here. Just to see May 24th. So it's the week, it's Memorial Day. So this is, and this is kind of what I was getting from it. Um, Norwalk is the weekend of the, the awesome, the awesome stuff. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Because <laughs> astrologers chose it. Makes sense. Um, but this is the aftermath. This is like what happens after. And even the, the Mars Chiron the day before or really the two days before, because it kind of is a little slow. Um, it sits there that 22nd degree for like two days, but you've got Mars Chiron in the weekend after this wonderful conjunction of Venus mm-hmm. and Jupiter. And then you have the next day, Mercury, Uranus. And it's almost like the ideas, the uh, come flooding in from whatever we experienced or the need to, exchange information about it. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, yes, we're going to do this. Now let's share our emails and like, here's your Google drive and all of that. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's make it happen. Um, and almost maybe even having to adjust to it, Mm. adjust to whatever happens, especially mentally like, Oh, this is different. You know, like, okay. I didn't expect this. That's, that's a urine Uranus saying, Whoa, where did that come from? Yeah. Right. And moon Saturn at that exact moment Mm. is, pretty close um more just like time to put your boots on and get to work you know uh whatever jim and i work there is to do yeah I, it's a really kind of interesting and it's exciting like an ending odd, yeah it's an odd chord to end the song of may it's like it's like that opening chord of hard day's night and the beatles it's yeah. like, <laughs> I knew exactly. It's like, it's pretty, but like, there's like something else. It's like making my dissonant. It's dissonant. Yeah. Yes. And I love dissonant stuff. I mean, Mm -hmm. actually, another person I was listening to right before this was Bonnie Prince Billy. Mm -hmm. And um, he's kind of, it depends on what kind of music you listen to. He's kind of obscure and he he writes these songs that it's like, does that work? And it does. And you don't know why that harmony works or that guitar part works, but But it's working. It's working. And you have to almost adjust to it, but it keeps you excited. It keeps you interested to be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. To me, that's soul. It's like Mm -hmm. the soul comes in when it's not perfect. It's a little like you, you hear the, you see the seams, you know, you kind of, you, you hear the humanity in it and 
And sometimes a dissonant can be like a little spooky. It's like, that's the, the shadow of Gemini is like, but there's dark stuff too. Like Mm -hmm. we're not just the friendly besties. Like we have, like, we hold all the secrets and all the grudges for everybody. So like, like we have that, that darkness and that's kind of exciting. Um, yeah, dissonant chord is how, it, how May ends, but that's not necessarily just a bad thing. It's like to be continued for June. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, June, June doesn't, I mean, just as an overview, we'll hopefully we'll record another video because I'd love to do it. Yeah. Um, and just as an overview, it's just uh, lots of Gemini, a new moon with Venus, square Saturn, that's going to happen. Mm. Um, and I think uh, of this summer, that looks like the the squareliest, like what is this square to Saturn going to be? Um, and then Mars will move into Taurus and that's going to be uh, pretty interesting because it heads straight for Uranus. I mean, yeah. and then, then, you know, as we get into July, we've got cancer season going on and things like that but yeah and the mars story starts to change then does <laughs> sure does right <laughs> around that time we don't have to talk about that again <laughs> no no we don't uh, but i hope that uh, we will talk about it in the future and i hope that people who are tuning in thank you by the way for tuning in yeah um we really, really love to, I love doing this i know it's so much more fun i don't ever prep either that's the thing it's like I kind of look at it. I make my calendar, you know, I go to um, Astro Seek and I see the ones that he brings up and then I kind of just flip through the ephemeris and I make it and then I just let it sit. So a lot of times when, when you and I are meeting it, it's like, oh, that's what it looks like. I want it to be fresh because I feel like astrology, you can overstudy it. You can just like be lost in the, in the facts of it. And I like the story, you know, story is how I remember. Mm. I don't remember facts necessarily. I remember that the Jupiter Uranus conjunction was at 2149 because it plays into my story. That's the only reason I hold on to that number, but I like just looking at it fresh with you could, to just be like, Oh, that's, you know, then this is happening. And the, cause then it's like to bring Bob Dylan back again, like so much of when he recorded, he would just like make people change instruments and they, they wouldn't rehearse. They would just jump into it because you capture that Kairos, you capture that soul, you capture that moment of music Mm -hmm. that you definitely kill by playing a song over and over and over and over to get it right it's like you can have it to be right by the letter of the law but by the spirit of the law it's really flat you know it's like you've squashed all the humanity out of it so i like doing it with you because you and i can just talk anyway together and but just to look at the astrology fresh it's just kind of like for me personally i get to kind of like see the month ahead with somebody that I trust and that I enjoy engaging with. So yeah. Same here. I I don't prep either other than the the calendar, but love back to you because I love that. I'm not the only one who feels that way because I, I, you can overstudy and, and, you know, it's fine depending on how you interact with reality. But if you're an intuitive person and a story person, it is so fresh when it just comes out and you're like, you get these images and these um, uh, metaphors that come come through and maybe even inform you, you know, like it mm-hmm. informs me when I talk just fresh like this. So, yeah, yeah just so uh, the audience knows that's how we do it. We don't. Yeah. <laughs> we studied it. I studied it for a long time, as you have, and it's just yeah. in here now. And so it's like I don't I don't generally as other than to support people. I don't consume a lot of astrology videos mm-hmm. either because again, I want it to be fresh and I'll consume things here and there to support, or like, if I really want to dig into something, but, um, generally speaking, it's for me, it's like a momentary thing. Like, it's Mm -hmm. like, I got to get it up and (laughs) I didn't mean to say that, but I got (laughs) to get it out. (laughs) Mars is in Aries, Venus in Taurus. Get it up like that maple. Yeah. I think also maybe what I'll do is I'll, um, I, I go down so many rabbit holes and I'm still in some advanced courses at nightlight astrology school and doing their counseling and astrology right now. And, um, you know, I think that there's a, a foil. I appreciate the, the fellow students that do really dive in and they're, they are very yes. studious with their, cause I'm like, Oh yeah, that's what that phrase is called. That phrase that I can't remember because I'm too lost in the story. So I I like that (laughs) the foil is there of those that, you know, the Chris Brennan's of the world that have the data. I mean, like it's not just storytelling. It is also observation of of data. 
And that's why it's it. I, I, I why I said um, <laughs> that w- the way you interact with, with reality, we need all of yes. that, and we yeah. need the the very data driven people to inform the story driven people. And we have yeah. to share back and forth because like um, uh, Kira's Deccan book, like I was like, mm-hmm. oh, thank God someone did this, you know, yeah. and and studied it and and looked at it, and it it's helpful. So, yeah. However you interact with reality is good with us. Well, I and like I'll it. F- follow up on that. So like what I'm doing currently is doing, I'm doing a lot of Deccan stuff. So I'm um, writing about the Deccans and I'm doing videos with, with different astrologers that hold that deck, that, that sign placements, you know? So I did Aries and I did Taurus and I bought Kira's Deccan guidebook because I want to support her because I think she's just incredible. And I really, I just want her to be supported so that she can continue to transmit what she's transmitting, but I'm deliberately not reading anything about the Deccans as I'm writing about it. Cause I'm like, Mm -hmm. you know, that not that there's not all of that is like perfectly valid information and beautiful information. Part of why I'm working with the Deccans is to see what comes up when I transmit it, because I have relationships with all of these signs too. And I have relationships with the tarot images because I do tarot. And so I don't want to be prompted by the keywords of other people necessarily. I already have some of it in my head and my own light little zeitgeist, but I want it to be a true transmission. I'm in a mercury year right now still. So it's all about the transmission. What is coming through so that what do I have? Like, why am I an astrologer anyway? Like, yes, I'd like to talk about it. It's a language that I'm able to, um, to, to help other people with, but also it's like, I feel called to do this. So I'm going to participate in a way that's a little brave and a little dangerous and a little uncertain. And I, I couch it with, I am no expert in this, but this is just what I'm playing around with, with the Deccans, because I feel like we all have that capacity in, in all do- different areas of astrology. What are you bringing that's genuine that you're called to do? follow that and don't feel like you have to do it because it was prescribed by someone else or that you have to do it exactly like other people. Like you have your own notes and your own voice that you can bring that nobody else can. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's actually enjoyable and human to like witness people kind of fumble along the way because we all fumble, you know? Um, so yeah, that's my deck and my, I love doing it, but that's like been my focus basically since the equinox is like writing and talking about the Deccans. Um, that's on your YouTube, right? Which is yeah. practical Astros. Practical Astros. And then, uh, sorry, my cat is. <laughs> uh, everything wants little... to make noise for me. I don't know why my chair <laughs> yeah, has she been keeps popping. like scratching my legs and like trying to play anyway. Um, yeah, practical um... Astros on YouTube and then I'm writing about it on Substack. So it's practical Astros Substack. So but you can awesome. find me Twitter, Instagram, and then practical Astros.com. It has all that information. So. Yes. And I'm Mandy Ray. I'm at ecstatic astrology. Sometimes it's ecstatic astro, depending on which platform, um, or ecstatic astrology.com. And, uh, we'll probably throw this on both of our YouTubes. Yep. Um, and as always, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, like, share, and subscribe. Do the little dance. Take a <laughs> chance. Change your dance. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>